those who are joining us online. Um, this is a special day. We extend a warm welcome to any visitors among us. We are in um, the season of Easter tide. So we actually sell Easter's not over. We celebrate Easter for 50 days until Pentecost, which will be on May 23rd. So we are still very much celebrating the risen Christ. And in celebration of Easter, we are also um, ordaining Aaron Mistily and installing Aaron and the rest of the new elders and deacons for the next couple of years. So we're very excited that this day has come and we get to mark that calling in their lives. I wanted to note those people. Um, so Aaron will be joining us online through Zoom, but Diane Diaz Piedra is here. Hunter Lewis will join us online through Zoom. Dave Smith is here. Kathy Ayers will join us online through Zoom. Lynn Carter is either going to be here. There she is. Yay. Lynn is here in person. And John Gordon is here in person. So it'll be a very unique ordination and installation. Some, some are here in, um, in body, but we are all here in spirit together. And we are so excited to celebrate this moment in each of their lives, as well as the future of Lamington under their leadership. We continue to gather as a prayer team at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. And so if you have specific prayer requests that you would like us to include, please let a member of the prayer team know or fill out one of those cards in the pews and hand it to a deacon, or you can put it in our prayer wall, which is still up in the back of the sanctuary. And hopefully you have marked your calendars for Saturday, June 5th, when we will celebrate Basket Day. We do have a few extra postcards that are save the dates if you would like to grab some for some friends and invite those in the community to join us for that wonderful day. Also, if you want to offer a promise to sell, Erin Miss Lee is collecting promises for the promise tree. So there's information about that in the back of the bulletin. If you would like to get in touch with Erin, please do so. That is it for the announcements, and now we will begin our worship service. I invite those of you who are able to stand to please do so and join me in the responsive call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. We worship in the Easter light, for the shadow of death is no match for God's love. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
friends, love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Christ has opened paradise. Alleluia. Confident in the hymns of old that tell the truth of the resurrection, we believe that we have already been reconciled to God through the word incarnate. Friends, let us humbly respond by taking an honest look at our lives and confessing our sin together. Let us pray the prayer of confession. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples, forgetful of your powerful presence and the strength of your spirit among us. Forgive us and give us your spirit that we may provide your grace to others in the name of the risen Lord. We continue in a time of silent and personal confession. Amen. By Christ's wounds on Calvary, from death's dread sting, we've be been made free that we may live eternally. Friends, there is no better news than this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And today we celebrate that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. And as forgiven and freed children of God, let us joyfully pass the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. You may be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Living God, we turn to your word this day with the hope and joy of Easter tide, trusting that you continue to give us new life as we seek to grow in our faith. Enlighten us with your teachings that we may overcome our doubts and live into the truth of your risen Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Listen now for God's word to you this day. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Here ends our first lesson of Scripture. Thank you. 
scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It is still Easter day. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when the Lord came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had to defend your faith? How do you state what you believe? I was born and raised Presbyterian, a product of devoted Sunday school teachers and solid Christian worship. But even at the age of 25, I wasn't really confident in stating what I believed. Seminary is typically a time of dismantling a naive faith in order to form a mature one. So after years of theological study and a decade of ordained ministry, I am finally able to stand up and talk about my faith with a little confidence. Still, there are times when, like Thomas, I wonder, is the account of the disciples really true? Our faith can't be scientifically proven. The greatest truth stands on the resurrection, which is a divine mystery. So doubt is inevitable. Actually, doubt is a very healthy part of our faith journey. Questioning what we think we believe helps us understand who Christ is in our lives. In my experience, I was eager to find words in my head to describe what I first understood in my heart. Your newest officers who are about to be installed have go gone through this exercise as well. As they each stated their faith before members of session as part of their training process, they articulated what they believe, which makes them better leaders. This is a process that we undertake together as disciples of Jesus Christ. Here, as the body of Christ, we consider what we believe before we are sent out to tell others what we have seen. 
As a colleague once said, there is a place for this in the body of the Christ. It is a place that is like a laboratory to practice what we believe before we have to go out into the world without Jesus. On Easter night, the disciples were scared of this world without Jesus. They didn't know what to believe as they huddled together, trying to figure out their next steps. They put themselves on lockdown because they were afraid of the Jews, that the Jews would come looking for them, that they might have to defend why they were friends with the guy who had just been crucified. In their stew of human anxiety, divine peace creeps through a locked door. Last week we learned that the tomb was no match for Jesus. This week's story teaches that a dead bolted door could not keep back the risen Christ from being present among his closest friends. He shows up and offers peace. He reveals his hands and his bloodied side, likely bearing these undeniable wounds of crucifixion. He offers peace a second time, and then he gives them a great charge. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Forgive. But one key person wasn't there that night of Easter. Thomas is the epitome of that ubiquitous acronym FOMO, fear of missing out. It's worse than scrolling on social media and seeing all your friends at a party that you didn't get invited to. Thomas wasn't there when the risen Christ first came to the disciples on the evening of the resurrection day. His friends stood around afterward, telling him, man, you should have been there. We got to see Jesus, hands and side and everything. He was right here. You missed it. Thomas is incredulous. He doesn't want to believe a word they are saying. Why would Jesus have appeared without him? And for years, we point a finger at doubting Thomas, the one who didn't believe Jesus rose. But that's not really fair. Thomas may not have been doubting Jesus. Thomas may have just been doubting his friends. Maybe they were bragging. Maybe they had a history of pulling his chain. Maybe he was feeling like the butt of a joke. So he says to his friends, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and touch it, I will not believe. Thomas wasn't so sure that Jesus had been there. So he makes this ridiculous demand. And a week later, he gets the opportunity to come face to face with the risen Lord. Jesus doesn't hold back from us when we need him. Jesus returns to Thomas. He knows that Thomas needs to be in on the drama too. Appearing to Thomas becomes this story that lasts millennia. So Jesus offers Thomas his peace. And he even invites Thomas to put a hand in his wounds, which the other disciples didn't get that invitation, only Thomas. The Caravaggio painting on the front of the bulletin shows Thomas actually touching Jesus' side where they had speared him on the cross. But the painter took great liberty in his interpretation of this story because according to the Gospel of John, we don't read that Thomas actually reached out to touch Jesus at all. We learn in the story that seeing Jesus face to face eliminates any doubt that Thomas had held that week. 
He didn't have to rely on the witness of his friends. Thomas got to bear witness to the risen Christ himself. When we explore whether or not we can believe the gospel story for ourselves, it is almost like we first have to mimic the incredulity of Thomas. According to, to John, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. When we feel full of doubt, that doesn't scare Jesus away. That doesn't even hold Jesus back. Instead, I'd like to think that he bursts through the locked doors of our hearts the places deep down within, we don't even know we can let Jesus in. He doesn't need an invitation. He just shows up. When we have questions and fears, he may first send us some of his followers to share their faith, to offer their views, to tell the story of their experience. But when that is not enough to combat our disbelief, Jesus meets us right where we are. He shows up in our lives. He blesses us with his presence and his peace. And he sends us forth as witnesses to offer his peace to others. When we encounter Christ these days, it is not to stare at a risen body in the form of the personhood of Jesus. It is through the presence of the Holy Spirit. When our eyes are opened to God's gifts in the world, we begin to understand what we believe about the risen body of Christ. We see how God reveals himself in all things. Thomas wanted to see the resurrection of the body. So he was prepared to recognize it when Jesus met him right where he was. Jesus offers us those encounters too, but they are more subtle these days. A sunny spring day after months of snow on the ground, sandwiches made for the homeless nearby, a socially distanced visit from a friend, a clean scan after radiation treatments, the eyes of a newborn baby, a homemade meal, daffodils sprouting up in the garden, a vaccination appointment. When we notice these gifts in our lives, when we take a moment to stop and give God the glory, then we come to understand that God wants to be intimately connected to us. For the early Christians, according to Acts, they lived such communal lives with one another. They shared God's grace so intimately that there was not a needy person among them. When we enact our faith by giving of our time, our energy, our money, then we help others to see love embodied. Our witness can extend to those who weren't in the room where they could put their finger on its origin. In Dostoevsky's classic Russian novel, The Brothers Karamazov, Ivan Karamazov is an atheistic intellectual. He seeks peace and meaning in the world. He often challenges his devout Christian brother, Alyosha, making him defend his faith and articulate what he believes so that Ivan can better understand. Ivan cannot grasp the faith of his brother when he considers the suffering of the innocent. One might call him doubting or incredulous, but still he has moments where he wants to believe he confesses to his brother, I want to be there when everyone suddenly understands what it has all been for. All the religions in the world are built on this longing, and I am a believer. 
Perhaps this is what the disciple Thomas wanted as well, to just be there when the other disciples suddenly understood. Jesus' wounds were existential proof of all that he had been through. By his wounds, we are healed, not just for our own health, but so that we can be sent out into the world as wounded healers for others. Each year we return to this Easter place where we see our risen Lord and we try to make sense of it all. We are believers, and as we long to see the Lord, let us live out our faith to offer others the chance to see and believe as well. Amen. And now with the confidence of Christians across all the ages, I invite you to stand with me as you are able And together, let us affirm the faith of the Christian church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to sit down as I invite the new elders and deacons to come forward who are present. And as I said, today we are joined on Zoom with Aaron and Hunter so that they can also participate in this service of ordination and installation. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by our baptisms, and we are marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, as ministers. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word through through the word and administering of the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of Lamington Presbyterian Church now ordains Aaron Mistily, to the office of ruling elder, and having already been ordained, installs Aaron, as well as Diane Diaz Piedra, Hunter Lewis, Dave Smith, and Lynn Carter, excuse me, Dave Smith to the office of ruling elder, and installs Kathy Ayers, Lynn Carter, and John Gordon to the office of deacon. I'm afraid we might be having technical difficulties with Zoom. So I'm going to wait a minute until we get Aaron and Hunter back. Oh, did we lose connection?
Is the network. Remarkable. Hi, Aaron and Hunter. We're back. <laughs> I was just about to get you to reaffirm your baptismal covenant. Ordination calls the whole church to renewed commitment, as we have just stated in the Apostles' Creed together. And now is the time when I ask Hunter and Aaron, and John and Diane, and Dave and Lynn to renew their baptismal vows renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule to affirm the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. So trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please say, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, please say, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, I will with God's help. I need to put my mask on. Sorry, guys. It's getting too close. Sorry, I'm vaccinated now. Okay. Okay. And now is the moment of the constitutional questions of the Presbyterian Church. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him, Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit? the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you. If so, please say, I do. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, please say, I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? 
And now just for the deacons. This is for Len and John and Kathy. Will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And now to Dave and Diane and Aaron and Hunter. Will you be a faithful teaching elder, a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And speak loudly. Do we, the members of Lamington Presbyterian Church, accept Diane Diaz Piedra, Hunter Lewis, Aaron Mistela, Dave Smith, Kathy Ayers, Lynn Carter, and John Gordon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? We do. And do we agree to encourage them? to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you and equipped them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, elders and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, Deacons, elders, and pastors serve together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Kathy, Lynn, and John that they may be faithful deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve where there is need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel. In everything, give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Aaron, Diane, Dave, and Hunter, that they may be your faithful ruling elders in this church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every court of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Lord, this we pray in all gratitude, seeking to give you glory for sustaining us in ministry. We pray all this 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Aaron, you are now ordained. And Aaron, Hunter, Kathy, John, Diane, Dave, and Len, you are now installed as deacons and elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation of Lamington Presbyterian Church. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. And whatever you do in word or deed, give, ev give thanks to God in everything. And I pray that your ministry will be a blessing to all and that it will be a blessing to you as you seek to do all that God has called you to do in this life. Amen. We typically would have a, a laying on of hands and a greeting of our new leader. In the book of Acts, we hear that all believers were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for all that was valuable was distributed to each as any had need. Friends, the church today does not ask for you to sell all your belongings and lay every proceed at the apostles' feet. But we do give you the opportunity to respond to your faith by showing generosity. While our giving looks different in this time of pandemic, we do gratefully receive your gifts as you offer your financial contributions as well as yourselves in service. Eternal God, we do not give as we ought, for we are afraid and full of doubt. Yet we praise you for sending us your Son to give us more than we need and inspire us to live in ways that are not self-serving, but are life-giving in your name. Receive our tithes and offerings and multiply our gifts that this church would serve as a brighter light for our surrounding community, and that others would come to know you and believe in you. Amen. <laughs>
The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you and those whom you love wherever they are this day and always. Amen.